Next from Springfield, we head to a committee hearing on Governor Rauner's tort reform bill. This runs about 35 minutes. Uh, does this uh, bill have any impact on the fiscal year 2016 budget? As I stated yesterday, all of these reforms will kick in in terms of helping our revenue situation over time. It may have impact on it, or it may be the following year. The question is, though, do we simply not do reforms because it's not going to have an immediate impact? Just putting reforms off, just like kicking bills down the road, is not a good way to do business, and it's gotten us into the problem we're in. So there's potential it would help. I mean, if we demonstrate to the business community that some of these reforms make Illinois a more hospitable state in which to do business, I could certainly foresee us um, having additional um, revenue come and, in. And le Leader, I think this is a critical, critical point. I mean, this is something that is fundamental to what the governor has said, that these reforms are directly tied to our budget, to the future of, of fiscal sanity in the state, to be able to grow our economy, to be able to create jobs, to be able to have the revenue base for our budget so that we are not just I competitive but it. also if he, if compassionate. He could, if you could, if you could, Mr. Could, Mr. Could, chairman, no, I should no, say. No, no, I am the chairman. I am the chairman. Mr. Chairman. I am the chairman. This is not the governor's office. Mr. Chairman. Senator Hayne, you recognize. Mr. Chairman. So these bills, in essence, um, essentially were the same bills that the go had the governor had in mind in January or December, <clears throat> but for the compromises that you, you refer to as compromises. These are essentially his ideas that he expressed in this November, December, January, right? S Senator, what I would say is that these are reforms to our lawsuit system that we know is broken incorporating uh, thoughtful concerns that many members from both sides of the aisle raised during our working group session. Was this essentially what the governor was talking about in December and January? Essentially. It remains lawsuit reform that the governor... Right, that he had talked about in the turnaround agenda last year, right? As far as I understand, these ideas have been out there. Is your question for a long about time. process? For a long, yeah. long time. Then why wasn't a bill filed in January? You know, I think that we um, went into this yesterday to right, some degree. Right, we did. You know, I think the timing issue is completely bogus. There are many things that we do in this building where we talk about things conceptually for a long time, and then a bill gets dropped shortly before the end of session. I mentioned a couple of examples yesterday. So if you think not acting on concepts that have been in bill form in previous years that have been discussed in general and then specifically in a working group all session and you're going to complain because we just now saw the language that right. is a complete and other utter excuse for voting no and keeping illinois in the rotten position it's in well okay i'll, I'll get to the second part of your statement madam of the leader but the first part remains that no bill was filed and we had working groups now was the defense bar admitted to the working groups well, I don't think we should have the lobbyists drafting the well, bills. So, we, we similar shouldn't. to yesterday. I'm shocked. I'm well, shocked that you would say that. Well, so, yeah, who I, drafted I am this bill? Well, well, well Senator, <laughs> I, I will just say this, because this came up yesterday, and it shocked me yesterday. It shocks me again today. I know Governor Rauner is not from Springfield. I'm not from Springfield. A lot of us are not from Springfield. And I have to That's say that the, that the culture, the culture in Springfield has to change that lobbyists, uh, status quo, should be in the room to write your legislation. The people Governor who was sent are here to get the lobbyists out of government counselor, the people, the back people in, who are affected by the consequences of a matter have retained people to bring their consequences to us. And you, you chose to ignore the age old sy system of having legislators rely upon people to tell them the consequences. That's your choice. But to say that this is, an, this is the end product after working groups on May 27th is simply not proper. And then to hitch it to six months of traveling around the state 
telling the world that Illinois is a terrible place to do business doesn't seem to be a positive act to me. Senator, I can assure you that the um, experts, the um, folks you're referring to, the trial bar, the defense bar, were in the room via those legislators that were actively participating. They were invited to have input into these discussions. The question is, where do we draw the line? I mean, do we want to have the lobbyists standing with, right behind us at our desks when we press the button? I mean, at what point do the legislators actually take over the process after they have the input from the special interests who, frankly, in this state are extremely entrenched and have an inordinate amount of influence over public policy and in many cases, I think, have um, caused good public policy to fall to the wayside. So to suggest that there was an input from the experts is, is just not realistic. Well, I'm suggesting that, that the process in this matter, these two ma matters, is a broken process. It's a broken process. We have a process where, where people come forward and enlighten the legislators as to the consequences of the legislators' good ideas. And we do it in a constructive way. So you'd have a bill that would be passing by now that would have many of the reforms in it that you've wished. And it would be done with eyes open and an idea of reform. Instead, we have a bill on May 27th that you say is a c compromise, but no one has had an input in it except for you. S S Senator, if respectfully, I, I do have great respect for you and your career in the Senate. I would just say that uh, to accept the status quo of special interests and lobbyists writing legislation is something that we reject. And it is, is really the reason why, Mr. Chairman, and I said at the beginning. Counselor, why, I'm why, not why suggesting are, they write the legislation. I'm suggesting that the way we have historically done things here and in all states of the U Union and Congress is to have people in the room negotiating with the legislators who know the consequences to their groups. Lobbyists. Whether again. it's... Lobbyists. Oh my, am I saying a pejorative here? A lobbyist? Is I, that I, a I, word that we don't wish to say? Is it your take that if we admit that lobbyists are here, that this is an evidence of a corrupt system? Is that a better system or a worse system than putting $30 million in the bank to threaten anyone who's going to vote no on this bill. Is that the American way? S Senator, all I would say Senator, is Senator, I'm going to ask you to keep, uh, we did have the extortion bill yesterday, so keep it to this bill. And we would urge a vote on our constitutional amendment on term limits as soon as possible. <laughs> Senator Would you Connelly? like to complain about taxes too, Mr. Goldberg? That seems to be your fallback whenever things aren't going your way. S Senator, I think you're vice chair of assignments. Can you tell us why we have not assigned Senator Connolly, you recognize? on term limits? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and we were in a rush yesterday. I wanted to commend you for that tie. Uh, you could pull it off, that bow tie. I don't think I could. I have a quick question for council, and it's about joint and several. In this building, we take from other states. You know, we take ideas from blue states, red states, whatnot. But when it comes to this, I want to look at demographically similar states, Ohio, Pennsylvania, New York. Um, and, I'm, and my eyesight's really bad. I, I don't wear ch those cheater things. But I'm looking at this, and it appears that New York, Ohio, and Pennsylvania have a system that is similar to what you're proposing here. Would that be a fair statement, or how would it differ? That's a fair statement, except that in those three situations, New York and Ohio um, have severalness up to 50% rather than 25%, so it's exactly what we're proposing. In the case of Pennsylvania, it's actually up to 60%. So those aren't, those aren't Republican-run states, New York in particular. Right. Um, I had a question for Mr. Levitt. Absolutely. And it's, and it's probably in anticipation of testimony from the opponents, and, and I've heard this a lot. 
I've tried cases as a plaintiff, as a defendant, tried a case against uh, your partner, Tom McGarry, who's a fabulous trial lawyer. Um, you're going to hear, at least I think you're going to hear, because I've heard it time and time again, that if you look at the jury verdict reporter over the past 10 to 15 years, you see a reduction in the, in the, uh, the settlements and the verdicts and like. So would that be a fair, because I hear it all the time, is that, is that a fair characterization or is that incorrect? And I'm just- I, I, don't, I'm, think, I don't think there's any, I certainly haven't done an empiric study and I haven't seen one that suggests that verdicts or settlements are changing significantly over time. Now, has the public's mindset changed to some extent? You know, there was the famous McDonald's coffee case that had national news and there was a lot of discussion about it. And so, as people have begun to realize what some, not every case, I mean, I've had trucking cases where my trucker crossed the center line and, and killed people, we settled that case, all right? I mean, there are cases all over the place. Right. But I think that the, overall, the mindset of jurors has become more attuned to the fact that there are more cases that don't deserve, don't belong in the system. That doesn't mean that settlements are changing. I mean, the plaintiff's bar is very, very good at what they do. I like to think that we're very good at what we do. And so the cases that stand on their own individual merits as opposed to a statistical study. Uh, Senator Barrickman is recognized. Thanks. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. You know, I, I love the discussion about the process. I've got to admit, I mean, it's, it's wonderful to, to hear that from this side of the aisle. I mean, you guys have been running the process for as long as I've been here. And you know it's 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 uh, it's a it's uh, it's humorous to sit here, it, you know, in the minority party, hearing the majority party. You, you control every level level of the uh, of the legislature, and you're complaining about the process. But let, let's talk about the um, let's talk about the the process some more. I mean, so so here we have these. We, you know, there are um, two branches here. I think we're hearing of some of the ideas out of the governor's office, and those ideas are being presented to the legislature here. And, and I'm curious, you know, to the administration that, um, you know, the administration admittedly said, this is the way in which uh, we propose to present our ideas. We want to put lawmakers in a room and put our ideas on the table and have a serious conversation about that. It, can you it, can you share with us? I mean, who 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 was a part of the working group here that resulted in this and and shed some light on me uh, for what the you know did you have meetings? Did you you know the 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 press has asked some of us about the, these meetings? I wasn't in this this particular working group. Can you share with me who was a a part of this and and just what what some of those conversations were like uh, that resulted in. The, the changes that you made and ultimately what's proposed here? Senator, I'll, I'll speak generally in response uh, because I, I don't want to break good faith negotiations, which I believe if we wanted to get back to today, we could do that. Um, but there was a process. The governor invited the four legislative leaders to participate in working groups uh, right after we uh, got through the uh, fiscal year 15 uh, budget fix. Um, the leaders agreed, all four of them, uh, appointed uh, members of the legislature to represent their caucuses. Uh, we worked uh, together as a group uh, with staff, uh, uh, members of the legislature, members of the governor's staff, legislative staff, uh, once, twice, sometimes three times a week, uh, working through these issues, working through our proposals, asking questions, taking questions, hearing criticism, hearing concerns, trying to address those concerns, trying to address those criticisms. Uh, we got to a point where we felt we had addressed uh, most, if not all, concerns uh, that were raised for various pieces of legislation, uh, and the governor decided that uh, we should move forward with uh, filing those legislations, and, and Leader Redonio uh, introduced that compromise legislation, that uh, one of which we're here today to talk about, one of which uh, this committee rejected yesterday on workers' compensation reform, property tax freeze, which will be an executive uh, later today, uh, and also two constitutional amendments, one to impose term limits and one to end political gerrymandering with a fair map. Those two constitutional amendments have not been assigned to committee as of today. 
So, so in all these in all these discussions, was there was there a suggestion by the majority party that they had some better form of sitting down together and trying to find areas for which uh, we all might agree upon? Did they suggest some alternative? Yes, there was, Sarah that? Berkman. I was in that working group, and I, and I suggested it. Having worked on workers' comp uh, four years ago, I suggested that having the manufacturers in the room, the Illinois Chamber of Commerce, even Caterpillar, one of our major, major um, manufacturers, they were so party, you, parties so of you, interest. Um, and we had the trial lawyers in the room, we had labor in the room, we had sure, small and, and so representatives of small business, and having all those stakeholders in the room giving input, going back and forth on a daily basis over the course of a session from January when the session began, all the way to May, on a daily basis, going back and forth, thoughtfully through a process. I suggested that that would be a better process. Right, and I, you know, here's what's, here's what's again enlightening, I mean, I, I don't think anyone stopped anyone from doing that. I mean, you did it in 2011. People know how to do that. They've done it historically. No, one's, no one has stopped the majority party from doing what they've done in the past here. But, but let, me ask, let me ask another question. There the, was pretty, the pretty, pretty good security at the door, actually. Another question maybe of the administration. So, so through all this, and, and here we have a, uh, an, important, an important piece of legislation before us, uh, you know, the, the suggestions that are now reflected in, uh, in text in a bill. Were there, you know, the, to the concerns that other people might raise on these very technical issues of venue reform and joint and several liability, did, did the majority party ever come to you and say, you know, here's the language that we want in this uh, lawsuit reform package? Did they ever offer uh, you their, their language? On those specific issues, no, Senator. And so, you know, I, so here we are on, on this, this term, term limits legislation. I mean, uh, the, the process, everyone's ridiculing the process. It, I, I, I would remind the senator that this is not term limits legislation. No, that's right, that's right. On the, on the process here, is, the, is this process for which, you, you know, the majority party is so critical of going to result in a hearing on some of these other pieces, proposals made by, by Leader Rodonio? I, I would remind the senator we're we're here discussing the senate the, the leader's bill well, I'm, on I'm lawsuit actually, reform. I'm actually responding and to the questions raised by at least two, if not more, members. Well, that would be nice if you were presenting a bill, Senator Leader Rodonio. Is you? I think you've been around here long enough to understand the process, the committee process, the legislative process. The, the leader Rodonio is presenting a bill on uh, tort reform right and that is the right. matter that we're here the, to discuss the, right now we have uh, a series of other bills and, and if you'll notice I, I, I invite you to pay attention as we go through the same process for each one of those other bills and and you, you'll see a consistency there uh, and one of the things about that is in that process it often happens that I vote no to, to a bill, you vote no to a bill, and you don't necessarily uh, offer a counter proposal. You just vote no. You've done it a lot, a whole lot. But for each one of those issues, you didn't offer a counter proposal. You simply disagreed is, with is this, the proposal. Is this to this legislation, Mr. Chairman? Yes, it is. Oh, it is? Yeah. Well, I'm supporting I disagree. <laughs> you, you support I it. Yeah. I disagree. So I'm going to vote enough. no, and you're going to vote yes. That's part of the legislative process, Senator. And so to the bill, your questions to the bill. Right, my questions to the bill, in response to those questions raised by uh, my, my esteemed colleagues across the, the uh, table here, to the process, and to your points, Mr. Chairman, there is a process which results in us having an opportunity to vote yes and no. And I do believe the leader has multiple pieces of legislation, some Proposed constitutional amendments, which v, I hope we can get to. And again, Senator, we went through this yesterday, and I'm, I, don't, I don't have a great patience to go through it today. We're here to discuss this bill. We're not here to discuss term limits. We're not here to discuss redistricting reform. We're here to discuss uh, the process. To show, <laughs> to show respect to the leader to have her bill on tort reform heard. All right? And that's what we're here to do. And if, you, if you're going to ask, if you're going to go somewhere else, I'll move on to Senator Nybo. 
I was just, I was. Mr. Chairman, may I, um, as a sponsor, make one observation? Uh, Senator Haynes' questions were about process, quite honestly, and you did not become agitated about that. So, uh, you the know, The process, it, seems it was, Leader, with all due respect, it was the process of the bill. The process Correct. of and the bill. Correct, and that's what I understand this question to be about as well. So, I mean, it seems to me that process has sort of been let in the door here. I said from the get-go, I said yesterday, this process argument is bogus and it's nonsense. These ideas and many bills that we've passed in this chamber have gone through similar processes. Um, so that is just nonsense that we're going to vote a bill up or down based on process. And I respect that, Leader, you know, and, and, and likewise, I think you respect the fact that in every piece of legislation, we don't go through a counter proposal process, right? Uh, like, like has been indicated. Some, I'm, I imagine you often just vote no, and you don't say, we don't consider you any less of a legislator because you didn't offer a counter proposal. You just fundamentally disagree with the proposal. Okay. So, so, so to this, right? So let's get to the compromise that you know that's on the table. And, and yesterday during the budget hearing, there was all this discussion of the fact that this was an ongoing co conversation that we were embarking upon, this shortly before a very partisan roll call vote on a budget. It's going to spend some $4 billion that we don't have. Is today's discussion about lawsuit reform part of the ongoing conversation and the hopeful compromise that we may reach here? Leader Radonio, you can answer the question that's been no, that's, posed to that's, you. That's not, that's, that is a, let's, you know, specifically maybe to Senator Harmon's comments before of whether or not this is a compromise. Okay, Leader Radonio, you can answer the Senator's question because you're the witness. Any of the witnesses want to answer? This is the process, Senator. We, right. we, don't, we don't go through the process of asking questions to the, from, to the from legislator maybe, to legislator. To the, to the administration. Senator Nibel, you recognize. To the, to the administration on the compromise here. Senator Nibel, you recognize. Mr. Chairman, one last question on the but Senator Nibel, you recognize. Is is this compromise Senator Nibel, related to you recognize. the to the budget discussions of yesterday? Is this Clerk, compromise take the related? Roll. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Good morning. My, my name is John Cooney. I'm the current president of the Illinois Trial Lawyers Association. Appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Um, and I'd like to direct my comments uh, to the bill. Um, I, th I don't know how many of you were available or, or had the opportunity over the last several weeks to see the men and women who testified in this building about the very real consequences of bills just like this. Uh, we, yesterday I heard some conversation about unintended consequences. I think there are some intended consequences here for some very real people in this state who are among the most vulnerable citizens we have. Um, I would recommend to anyone who saw that testimony to share it with your colleagues. And uh, I've seen a lot of testimony in my life. I've heard from a lot of people what happens when amendments like these and laws like these begin to affect real people. And everyone from the, the widows of the Illinois State Troopers who were killed to the people who ended up because of particular litigation devices in other states, what happened to them, I think it speaks volumes about the values that some of the senators discussed yesterday. Um, specifically as to these bills, um, I think the, the overall idea is that laws have consequences. On the first amendment about joint and several liability, remember, Lost in all this conversation is, is, the, is the fact that we don't have joint, pure joint and several liability in this state. And we haven't since my colleague and classmate David mentioned since the mid 80s. If you are in an accident or your husband's in an accident and he's killed and it turns out it's 51% his fault and 49% your fault, you don't get 49% of the value, the judgment, you don't get anything. You get zero. We've tilted this in favor of the defendant already. And the conversations about, well, what happens if you're just not that liable, but somehow you get stuck because someone else is? We've already tilted it. 
so that if someone is less than 25% liable, they are severally liable. Well, why should that matter? Why, does that, why is that a consequence that should matter? Well, think about it. What if I or my wife or somebody is killed in an accident as a result of two other individuals and they caused it? So they're the people who are responsible. And if it turns out one of them flees the scene or gets away or is, goes, hides in bankruptcy and becomes insolvent, who should bear the risk of that loss? Should it be the responsible party or should it be the widow? I think the law recognizes that in that situation that it is the wrongdoer who has to bear the responsibility of that. But here, by suggesting this, and they seem like little um, small items or issues regarding percentages. These are very real consequences to people. Um, one of the things that is suggested here, it's, it, it, it actually encourages one of the most age-old tactics that all trial lawyers try to do. What they're saying here is, we should be able to put a tribute fault to everybody, even people that can't be sued, to the government, to the employer, to whoever. And that results in something that learned counsel are very good at. You try the empty chair. You come into court and you say, everyone else is to blame, this guy, that guy, the employer. But of course, that person's not in court. That person's not defended. There's no lawyer for him. But our law is logical and reasonable. What it requires is that if you want to blame somebody else, bring them into the case. Sue them. Have them here. If you're right, you will win. If you're wrong, you will lose. These are not concepts of uh, what, what, which is what I would call a litigation trap to say, well, what we'll do is we won't have a lawyer, we'll blame him, his fault will be attributed, I'll be several liability, and the widow will bear the fact that there's no one there to be responsible. They're also lost in these conversations are the real things that the lawyers, these, these are among the most sophisticated, capable lawyers in our state. They know how to defend themselves. They know how to, they're, they're well represented in court. Um, but what's lost here is that somehow it, it, it implies that if somebody settles out of the case, that that doesn't come into play. If someone settles in the case and someone else goes to trial, the person who goes to trial, several things can happen. He could be found not guilty or he could be found guilty. And if he's found guilty, he gets a dollar for dollar credit for every nickel paid in settlement prior to that moment. This isn't a matter of he just settles that part of the case and then comes in later and gets a different uh, a settlement. That's all taken into account and it's all credit. Um, on specifically to the bill on venue. What the underlying issue here is, is should we have traditional concepts of where one can be sued and where venue can be brought? Well, it's, it's been true for every state and forever. Where does a corporation reside? It resides where it does business. Now, what would this amendment do? Well, this amendment would prioritize, as I think the leader said, or someone said, would, it would prioritize where they would open an office. I don't know what it costs to open an office or a, a, a post office box these days, but my guess is that if one had a huge amount of liability in, say, I don't know, a major metropolitan area in the state, for let's say General Motors had an ignition switch liability where millions of people live, well, I, I don't think it would take much advice to say, you know what we ought to do is open an office in Cairo, Illinois, as far away as we possibly could be, and let anyone who has a piece of litigation say, well, I'll go to Cairo, and good luck at getting a lawyer, and good luck at prosecuting that case for the death of your husband or your wife. Um, so I think one of the questions earlier asked seized upon this. This amendment in, in its, um, if you just look at it in a vacuum, doesn't take into consideration the fact that we already have laws that address these issues. If you're sued in a place where you don't think that's fair, you bring a motion for forum nonconvenience. These bills blur forum and venue. That's very dangerous. They have real consequences to real people. And the fact that if, if the forum is inappropriate, you bring a motion. 
and you say, why is this here? And we haven't heard. And judges do this for a living every day. They really are the experts in this. And they determine it's not fair. This case is being moved. And it can be moved out of state. It can be moved to another county. But it's done in a process. So I don't know much about legislative process, but judicial processes, it's done in a fair and ordinary manner. We don't just say, well, let's open up an office and then someone could manipulate where they want to be. And they could manipulate where they want to be in litigation. So opening up an office is a very dangerous concept to tie to anything. Um, and people do business where they do business. And that is traditionally where it's always been the case. Um, the, the issue of, um, and this one is, is lost upon me how this relates to some of the bigger issues that you all describe, but one of the things you're talking about is um, that it, it, the, the, there should be a jury instruction that doesn't talk about the amount uh, that was um, billed but that was actually paid. But actually that's neither of those of the law. What you're responsible for, if a drunk driver paralyzes somebody, he's responsible for the reasonable value of the medical expenses he caused. Not some other thing. What could be more fair than that? That he's responsible for the reasonable value of the medical expenses he caused. Not, what, I mean, what if somebody billed some outrageous amount of money? He shouldn't be responsible for that. But now what we hear is, well, let's make it tied to how much was paid by an insurance company? We in court don't say the word insurance out loud. I'd love to be able to go in there and say, you know that this gentleman here, this nice young lady who's sitting there who's, who ran the red light and killed my client, she's not responsible for any of these bills. She's insured. I'd have a mistrial in two minutes. But if we were gonna do that and we were gonna say, let's tie it to um, the amount that was paid by the insurance company, how would how would you explain that to, the, to a jury? And better yet, um, what, it, what, what, it, what it results in is a, a really perverse sense. You might pay years and years of your health insurance, and you're, because of the money you paid for your health insurance, you have a coordination of benefits, and there's a, an adjustment of a bill. So now who's supposed to get the benefit of that? You or the drunk driver who just killed your husband? He wants to come in and say, I want the benefit of the, of, the, of the insurance benefits that the guy I killed paid for. That seems to me to be a perverse sense, but it's worse than that. Because what really happens is that insurance company, they don't not pay attention to what's going on in this case. They come in with their lien and they get paid their money back. There's a right of reimbursement and subrogation in almost every insurance policy. And when they get that money back, if that difference, if the amount that they want back, you can bet that's gonna be the full amount, and the amount that the, was recovered from the, the def, from the defendant is different, who's gonna bear that gap? Once again, the paralyzed guy, the burnt up guy, his widow. That makes no sense. The current law is he's responsible for the reasonable value of the damages he caused. Those words weren't made up because they were just, they sounded clever. It's, it's logic in its basest form. So, so these amendments, as, as the, the consequences they have on real people, by the way, even as you list them, the, the analysis of um, several liability, a, a jury instruction bill, and whether venue should be by an open office, I've heard the debate about how this, these are issues that are gonna you know, change the economy. They, they won't bring one dollar into the Illinois state they won't create one job. This is litigation trap and inside baseball. I thank you for your time. Senator Harmon. <clears throat> thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Cooney, for your testimony. I, I'd like to drill down a little deeper on a couple of these areas so I, I can better understand them. I hope the committee can. Um, let's start with the venue. Uh, as I read the bill, um, Let's say a member of Senator Rodonio's staff who lives here in Springfield gets online and orders a product that is shipped to her home. She opens it up, she uses it's a blender. It blows up glass shards in her, the house burns down. That company opened up an office in say Boone County, maybe a PO box, maybe an office. 
Um, Senator Rodonia Stafford would not be able to sue here in Sangamon County. She'd have to truck 200 some miles north to Boone County to file there. Is that how, how you'd read the bill? And if they opened it in Joe Davies, it'd be a longer drive. Well, what, 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 if, what if the company that she ordered it from bought it from a manufacturer who opened up a, an office, a P.O. box in Pulaski County in the other end of the state? As I read it, she'd have to file two separate lawsuits in two different counties because the, the, they wouldn't have the same form. But it's even worse than that. There are cases where there are five or six defendants. There are cases that are complicated cases where there are dozens of defendants. You can't have th 36 different cases going at any one time. And if we had 36 cases going at one time for that purpose, all we would hear is about the explosion of litigation. <laughs> that would be an unintended consequence, wouldn't it? Well, no, maybe intended.